Welcome to the show, Lila. Thanks for inviting me. It's going to be fun to get into this topic. We haven't had someone specifically talk about competition and this field that you're interested in, in social dilemmas. But the way we start the podcast every time is the question I love to ask is really like, why do we need environmental psychology we the people that are listening to this podcast are sustainability managers climate change managers people working on startups a lot of us have come from an engineering or science background and we've never heard of environmental psychology so the people who are designing campaigns and programs tend to think in terms of it as an engineering or a political problem not a psychological problem I mean why is this a mistake for us (laughs) I think we can agree that right now we are not really acting sustainably as humanity, right? We are consuming more resources than can be regenerated at the same time. So it is not sustainable. And thus we do need some behavior change. And I think here it is very important to see what environmental psychology or psychology in general has to say about how people actually behave (laughs) because On one hand, we are trying to change individual behavior, like people in their everyday life, what can they do to be more sustainable? And, but even if we're talking about more broad interventions or systems change, politics and so on, I think it's very important that people also support the implementation of these changes or politics. And often people do not work the way we might expect them to, and might not support the action, even if it's intended to to do something good. So humans are very complex and environmental psychology is trying to disentangle all these factors that actually influence why people support a certain action and why they actually do something. So I think we have some important insights to, to add here to the technical solutions. I mean, it's a really interesting dimension that you bring up in this this sort of strata between individual action and government-driven systems-led action. Because people ask me this one question like all the time now, like almost every day. Somebody says, why do you look at environmental psychology or an individual behavior when what we really need is government and systems change? And I'm learning how to answer this question. And the question has many, many answers to it, not just one, but one thing that you just mentioned is that governments can't get progressive policy through if they can't psychologically tap into people to support that policy. So in that way, systems change and individual change is very much the same thing, but we really need to, we really deeply need to understand human psychology in order to get people to support the government getting something through. I mean, I mean, how do you see, like, let's say a carbon tax is one of the things that keeps on getting roadblocked over and over again. I mean, how can we best like sort of harness people's psychology to be able to, and we're looking at sort of individual psychology here in order to get these really big, bold policies through? That's a very good question. And I also think that we do need system change, that it it might not be enough that individuals are trying to do something in their private lives, but we need some bigger steps. And I'm I'm not an expert on this topic, but I think one of the most important predictors of people actually supporting policies is that they, they understand what is the purpose, like they care about the topic, they understand they are, for example, if we're talking about climate change, they do know that climate change is happening and they are worried about it, that will predict that they will also accept some policies that will mitigate climate change or aim at mitigating climate change. But I think there's a lot of different ways to get their support. I think one very different thing is to engage them in the decision. Like, do they have a feeling that they are participating in the process? Like, it's not just like top down from the government or from anyone else that there are some policies now and they should follow it, but they have an active role in determining how this will look like. I think that's also an important factor here. But I just think it's it's really interesting to try to to just illustrate to people that when we're looking at individual behavioral psychology, we're not just asking people to recycle more or not litter. We're actually asking how to optimize people's psychology in order to allow 
bigger systems change to come through, which is this really important dimension in psychology. But let's jump into your the, the paper that was the, the topic of conversation today. What was the big insight or message that you got from this paper about group competition? Well, we found that actually inviting groups to compete against each other in being the most sustainable group fostered sustainable behavior to a substantial extent. So people reduced their consumption of a common resource substantially when we invited them to compete against each other in being most sustainable group. So I think that this is a very good way to implement structural changes that involve the group somehow in being more sustainable. And why groups, not individuals? You could have taken people through the same type of activity. It was like a computerized game-like activity as just individual people competing against individual people. But the group thing was a different dimension. Why test the groups? And what's the difference between doing the same study on groups versus individuals? Yeah, maybe I should now explain the social dilemma perspective that we are employing. I guess it's my other question. What is a social social dilemma? Yes. (laughs) So I think like one broad explanation for why people are not acting more sustainable is to look at it as a social dilemma. And what is that? That is in general a situation where we have interdependence between actors. So what I'm doing influences the others and the other way around. And importantly, we have a conflict between individual and collective interests. So for every individual, it is beneficial to to consume resources. Like if I'm taking the car to go to work, for example, that is probably more comfortable and faster than taking my bike. But if we all do that, then in the end, we will consume so many resources that the situation is worse for everybody like the collective is bearing the costs for example air pollution exhaustion of resources also traffic jam yeah if everybody takes the car it just doesn't work out anymore but the individual profits so and the other way around it's it's a similar situation if you think about investing in in the solution like i'm bearing the costs of taking my bike because then it takes longer, I I may get wet in the rain, so it's uncomfortable, it takes longer, and all the others can profit from that, even if they are not contributing. So this is a situation that makes it inherently very difficult for individuals to actually pursue these collective interests, because it's against their individual interests. And what we were trying to do is to, to solve this dilemma, to get out of this situation, because it is in and itself, it is a competitive situation that leads to unsustainable behavior. Because when I'm comparing myself to others and I want to, to be better off than them, then I would not cooperate. I would not like reduce my consumption because I'm looking at my individual benefit. But then we were trying to take it to this group level to overcome this, this conflict within the group and foster more sustainable behavior. Because at the group level, I can compare myself to other groups and not anymore to the members of the group within the group. I think this was a bit complicated. <laughs> no, no, I'm listening. I'm, I'm, thinking, I, I'm, I'm thinking through it. When you describe what a social dilemma is, what I understand it's that I might want to do something good, but I have to bear a personal cost for the greater commons. Is this the same as tragedy of the commons? Is that exactly the same thing? And can you explain what tragedy of the commons is? The tragedy of the commons is a very well-known example of a social dilemma. So the original idea was here that we have a a number of people who share a common grassland or something, and they, they put a number of deer on it. And they profit from the more deer they put on it, the more they profit individually. But then if they put more and more, at the end, like this grassland will be destroyed and will be no longer available for anyone. So this was also an example where it would ultimately lead to the worst situation for anyone because they wouldn't have the resource anymore. And this is an example of a social dilemma where they share a common resource. And that was actually what we're also looking at in our study. 
because like the whole environmental like all environmental issues are social dilemma tragedy of the commons issues and this is what makes environmental the whole environmental industry and everything we do completely different to regular capitalism and trade it just any like startup or anything because they exist in a in a different world when we're trying to get rid of air pollution we've got fish in the ocean all of these climate change they're all common spaces they're all things that we share and the regular profit-driven capitalist model of one particular person or one particular business can like exploit and do well but it pollutes everything it makes the overall model we have for doing business it's just not a fit for when we're trying to deal with these deal with these 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 communal problems and I think that's a concept that's really hard for people that are very capitalist orientated to understand I mean have you found that that it's like that there's like a, if you're ever talking to somebody who's like really into entrepreneurialism and business can solve it and we need more innovation and we, we, we need more individual people to come up with solutions it's really hard to get past this social dilemma slash tragedy of the commons issue when sure you can be as entrepreneurial as you like but you cannot escape this thing that we all share these common resources yeah, well, I think it's very important to, to acknowledge this basic structure and understand how it can make it very difficult to pursue these collective interests. But of course, it's a question like, how do we deal with it then? Like, are we allowed to exploit the commons or should we like regulate in a way that, that we all have our equal share? That is, I mean, that's very big questions <laughs> and that can be answered differently by different people. Like if you have more access to resources, are you also allowed to, to consume more? That is actually also <laughs> part of my newer research. Like if people have different access to this resource, how does that influence their behavior in the situation? But I think the basic structure is, is very important. And I, I also hear it a lot that, or we know from research as well, that people do not want to cooperate or to, in this case, reduce their consumption, for example, if others are not doing it, like it's very important that the others are also contributing, which is something we call conditional cooperation. So I will do my part, but only as long as the others will do the same. And I, I hear that a lot that like my individual small consumption, like how can that change anything? So why should I even bother? It, it doesn't really have an impact. And that's really yeah, cool. that's a very, yeah. Yeah, it's... um. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting lens to look from because a lot of this type of environmental behavior change we're asking people of, I feel is like treating people like their islands. And it's a theme that comes up with every single person I interview, which is this concept of our social interconnectivity and our group structure. And me working in sustainability day to day as a practitioner, it's not talked about and it doesn't seem to be embedded into the way people are designing campaigns to understand that when you're asking somebody to do something you're not asking them as an island you're asking them in the context of their social environment and whatever groups they identify with and one of the so from what I understand what you're saying is one of the key messages or things to communicate to people while we're wanting people to change is to somehow let them know that everybody else is doing it that, that they don't want to people don't want to be like a lone voice or a lone actor that feels like their contribution yeah. is just dissolved Absolutely. out. They want to know that we're all doing it. Everybody's playing their part and we're all contributing as part of a group. Is that, is that right? Definitely. So I'm a social psychologist. So I, I'm all about the influence of other people on, on the individual. And, and we know that it's very important to ask what others do and what others think. And that is also part of why we chose to do this competition at the group level, because then we do engage a group of people at once and not just the individual. And this may make it easier, make, make create the feeling that we can actually achieve something because we are already few people doing it or a group doing it. And it's not just me and it's all in vain. So that was our thinking here, yes. So we can overcome this very difficult and it's like baked into the nature of the planet issue of the social dilemma through working as a group or working with a group identity model rather than 
treating people like islands. And that's a really interesting insight. This is why I do this podcast, because we learn all these, all these, <laughs> these really interesting, interesting things. Now, one thing I find is really interesting to ask researchers is every time somebody does a research paper, they're taking a slightly different angle to what has been done before. So you've obviously read all the existing research on environmental social dilemmas and competition. What was it in particular that was different that you were adding that was different to the existing research that had been done in the space? Well, I think our main approach was to come from this social dilemma situation, which is in itself very competitive, but in a negative way. So if I'm competing over this resource, then I will likely be even more unsustainable by taking a large part of it if I'm competing over it. But then we were thinking that maybe we could also use competition to increase sustainable behavior. And we did this by taking it to another level, by, by changing the focus of comparison. So people were no longer competing against the other group members, but against the other groups. So they did not have this, this competition within the group anymore, but between the groups. And the focus was on conserving resources instead of consuming resources. So here we, we could show that actually competition can be a very powerful tool to increase also sustainable behavior if we use it in the right place. Right, so if we design a structure around people that one, puts them into groups and two, flips the metric from consumption or whatever they're trying to individually gain from it, the flips the metric to conservation and we do those two things across groups, then we can have like the opposite effect. I mean, the opposite of the bad effect, which is, sorry, I should say that again. So if we can put people in these two structures around people, we can we can flip the behavior to instead of consuming too much resources, we can get them to save more resources, which I mean, that could be apply that overall like design metric or design system or approach could be applied to to anything. And, and so what in particular drew you to doing this? Like, what's your sort of personal motivation for being interested in this space? Well, I was fascinated by social dilemma situations in general, since I ever heard of it, because they are so prevalent in everyday life, and we're still not really able to solve them. And <laughs> it, it just often fails in, in the studies we do. And also in real life, we know that people take the, the easy road and look at their individual profit from time to time. So I think it is very interesting to do research on, on this phenomenon, like how, how can we influence behavior in these situations? And I think it's a very compelling perspective on sustainable behavior as well and can explain why we are not acting as sustainably as we should. And I think we need to change behavior to get more sustainable. And I just hope I can contribute a little bit with my research in pursuing this. So you must see these environmental social dilemmas everywhere now. Is it like when you like be looking to buy a car and then suddenly you see the car everywhere or because I'd never really thought about it this particular in the way we're talking about it until I was reading the paper last night. Do you just see social dilemmas like when you're walking down the street, when you're shopping in your house with your friends or they like <laughs> shouting at you from everywhere? can be like that yeah and I, I think it's also a good thing to realize like where are actually the interests and what is my particular interest now and what is maybe the broader interest because if we all just pursue our individual interest it doesn't work out we know that it might work out in the short run and if only I'm doing it but if I'm thinking a little bit further then I will realize that it is it just doesn't work out like if I'm never cleaning up after myself I'm living in a mess. <laughs> so at some point I should take the action and actually do something. And I think it's everywhere. <laughs> and do you know Ayn Rand and libertarianism? Is that, are you aware of that movement that we have here in Silicon Valley? Not so much. Can you? Oh, you haven't known about it? Well, no. it's actually, it's something that it's not very well known in Australia. So I only came across it since moving to America. So Ayn Rand wrote this book called Atlas Shrugged, and it's this book that gets used by the libertarian movement, which is people that don't believe in any government intervention. And it's all about that we require individual, individual innovation, the person that each person should completely invest in their own, their own like sort of selfish innovation interest. And if everybody is completely invested in their own personal growth, 
and the government is not getting in the way at all, then every single person will innovate to their fullest potential and that will be the greater betterment of, of humanity and the individual person. And it, it tends to be from what I can see that very wealthy white men, particularly in Silicon Valley, are all over it. Like they just love it. They're just like Ayn Rand, libertarian. I've never seen people who people who seem to be have less income don't seem to gravitate to it. That's like an odd, yeah. an odd thing about it. But I mean, in my worldview and in most of the people I would respect and be close to his worldview is that like it's got like a bit of truth to it. Like, cool, let's all innovate and flower as ourselves, but it's largely considered intellectual garbage, I think, by anyone serious. But I mean, just it sounds like your entire research field just completely just like kills that whole argument that we can all just completely invest in ourselves and then the world will just innovate into perfect harmony. I mean, it sounds pretty silly, right? <sighs> I think it's it's difficult. I mean, as you say, it's it's fine if people want to like pursue their ideas and 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 uh, innovate. <laughs> but well, one thing is the problem that people don't have the same preconditions. They don't have the same starting point. So I don't think like for some people this will work up really fine, but for others they do not have the chance to to just do what they want and and develop in the way they want. So I think it's it's difficult with the inequality that we have right now <laughs> to just let it be because that's a very like very unequal starting point and i don't know how it should be developed in a in a good direction so and also assuming that someone pursuing their own individual self interest doesn't always better everybody else like if your best interest is, I don't know, to like drive a big polluting car really fast <laughs> and create a lot of air pollution, I mean, that's directly affecting other people. It's directly affecting the commons. So there are so many case studies where people pursuing their individual self-interest can actually be quite bad for the group. But I think the biggest insight into these conversations is that these aren't black and white issues. And I think some people, well, not everybody, are uh, very drawn to black and white thinking. I think they get a mm. sense of peace from being able to think that there's a right and a wrong, that there is grey areas in all of these debates and we need to really bring some nuance and some deep thoughtfulness into the all the corners of, of what all this stuff means. I totally agree. <laughs> so in your research about we can put people in groups and then get the groups to compete for a sustainable outcome, for all the people who are working in the field this is like sustainability managers at cities people who run not-for-profits people who are trying to get more green space in cities trying to get governments to to bring in better better climate laws i mean how can we use it how can we sit down at a meeting we're like okay we've got to reach our climate goals and our green goals and our zero waste goals i mean what advice would you give to to people in their in their meetings trying to workshop this stuff yeah, well, I think my, my main advice is uh, not to focus on individual behavior, but to focus on, on groups. So try to target groups as a whole. So people don't feel lost, like they don't feel alone in, in doing this, but they can have the sense of identity. They can have a sense of efficacy because a group can reach more than an individual. So I would try to do that. And I think another insight is that maybe we don't always need interventions that require people to actually understand environmental issues and or to really care about it but maybe there can be other ways to engage people without them like really caring about environmental protection so in this competition people may join in just to compete because they enjoy competing because they want to win this or in the group competition case, because they want to be part of this group, they want to belong there, they want to achieve something together. And it doesn't really matter that it is about environmental protection or about green behavior. As long as they will do it in the end, that is what we want to achieve, right? So maybe we can think about more ways to engage people without this explicit goal of reducing energy consumption or anything, yeah. Well, I mean, this thing, this issue of education and environmental concern or attitude versus actual action design, I mean, it comes up like 
all all the time. And every time I do a guest lecture, it's like the first thing I, I start off with, that we tend to, a lot of us environmentalists have lived in a world, where we think if we just get people to care about the environment, we get people to learn about it, people are like, oh, we just need education. We just need people to care. I mean, people say that over and over again. We need education, we need people to care. And then you look at it through the lens of a behavior or an action designer, and then you're like, oh, we don't actually need people to really care that much. But again, it's not completely black and white. I mean, what are your thoughts? Like, do we really need to get people to care and educate people? Or can we just go in as like an action designer? And if we are going in as an action designer, like what is like the top three things we need to, to do to sort of get, get the action to happen? Well, as you said, I think it, it's not black and white. It's not that we do not need it. But it's also not, not the case that like everybody needs to care to the fullest extent. I think like knowing about environmental issues and knowing about how measures that we implement would improve the situation is very important for supporting some change like policy implementation, as we said before. So in this regard, it is very important that people do know about environmental issues and, and maybe also care to some extent. But it's not all like the other way around. You were saying like people who do know about it and people who do care about it, they do not necessarily behave in, in a way that, that fits these, these concerns. So they seem to need something more like some structural help or like the group is very important, for example. So they do need more elements to actually transform this concern into action. I don't know. That. No, that's cool. And <laughs> when you talk about groups, like what type of groups are we talking about? We're we talking about like schools, like companies, my neighborhood. I live in an apartment with about, there's probably like 50 apartments here. I mean, we could be a group. Like, like what, what are we talking about groups? Like, what are we, what are we talking about? Yeah. So in our study, actually, we just randomly group people together, like, because they were participants. So actually, we did not even have real groups, but we simulated groups <laughs> in our study. So it was completely random strangers that were in your group, supposedly. But our idea is that it will work even better if people actually identify with this group, like if they feel they belong to this group. So in that sense, it could be any entity that, that people have some feeling of belongingness to, as you suggested, like schools or school classes. But it could also be neighborhoods. I think that's also a very interesting research area that, that has come up. Like how do neighborhood initiatives foster sustainable behavior? And I think it's very promising if you identify with your neighborhood to just use this and, and take this group as a starting point. Yeah, I'm hoping to launch a new, a new project soon called Block Club, which is trying to get people in blocks and a very ethically based block it was partly inspired by another group who's doing this and i was thinking about all the gamification work that i do and they did something with blocks and i thought of putting it together which is getting people in in neighborhoods and so the the, the geographic granularity is a lot smaller you could think about your city or even your suburb but it's still pretty big there's maybe like 20,000 or 50,000 people, right, in a suburb or a city, whereas just my particular block or neighborhood, I mean, we might just be talking about 50 people or 200 people. And that's something that I can identify with and feel more bonded with if the group is that small. It feels actually like a real group or like, like a family. So do you, you think that's, that's a promising a promising space. Have you come? Have you seen any any research done on small, this very granular, like geographic groups? I think there is some research in in the Netherlands where they are looking at neighborhoods that actually like implement sustainability initiatives, like bottom up, like from the from the people itself instead of top down, organized by by some larger actors. So and it's very promising if they do it bottom up and actually. They also find that it's not so much caring about the environment that, that makes people join these initiatives, but it's more the feeling of belonging to this group and, and wanting to be a part of this group that motivates people to take part in this. So again, <laughs> the groups are, are just very important in motivating action. I mean, I think so. It's been actually something that's come up in the last like five podcast interviews I've done is this focus on groups. So now I'm like group obsessed, you know, I'm like, oh, like, what could I do with groups? See everything through groups, 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 groups. And it's crazy that it's like 
most of the people who work in this space tend to not not think this way now sorry i'm just got i lost my train of thought now i've got to get to my next question what do i want to okay <clears throat> And what I wanted to ask you also was about different personality types and how they relate to competitiveness. And so I've done a, a bunch of gamification design on environmental behaviors and tested it with people. And I, I just try all the bells and whistles. I'm like, let's show people some numbers, some color. We'll put them on a leaderboard. We'll tell them whether they're doing worse or better. We'll give them smiley faces. We'll give them badges. And it's really interesting showing people how different types of people seem to go for the, the different parts of the design so some people will look at the leaderboard and then they'll just be like oh my god I must who is Dan I am going to beat Dan you make sure I'm going to turn every light off until I beat Dan they don't even know who Dan is and they're like why did they get a badge how do I get a badge and so and then other people are like totally disinterested in what other people are doing they're just interested in the data so a couple of friends of mine are engineers kind of phd engineering types they're like i don't care about people i just want to really understand what all these numbers mean and i know for me personally on the products i was really responsive to the color like i didn't care too much what other people did it was i'm a very visual person so the color really got to me whether i was like in the orange zone or the green zone um mm -hmm. and so i saw this also in your research that there was this term called dispositional competitiveness and that people have these personalities they have different sorts of competitiveness and so my question is, when we're designing systems to get people to do sustainable action, do we need to be like thinking of people that we're dealing with a community that's going to have a lot of different personality types? And some people might be highly responsive to a competitive based type of design. And we want to make sure that we're catering for those people that have those personality attributes. And then you've got other people that seem to be very communal minded and actually really don't like the idea of competition. They want everyone to get along, everybody to help each other. And I'm sure you've got other dimensions in there as well, but we need to consider these personality variabilities and be designing for all types. I mean, is that, am I sort of on the right, going on the right path with this? Absolutely. So this was also one of the ideas in our study that maybe the competition would work differently for people depending on their like in level of dispositional competitiveness, which is the like overall like the tendency to to enjoy competition or not. Like if, if you're someone who really hates to compete and and go against other people, then of course maybe it will not work as well for you than for someone who's who's highly invested in in taking part in such things and and enjoys it. And we tested this idea, so we measured people's competitiveness like in general do you agree that you're like competition that you enjoy taking part in competition or not and looked at how the effect of this group competition that we introduced differed depending on on your score on this competitiveness scale and actually we did not find this effect so the group competition that we tested in our study did work the same way for people who said they enjoyed competition and for people who said they did not enjoy it as much. So in our study, we do not have the evidence that we really need to tailor it to depending on, on how, how a person is. But in general, I think we do often find this, that like the person variables influence how people react to the situation and how to interventions that we're planning. So if you know who are the, the people that you're targeting, then I think it's a good thing to, to think about how they are, like if they care more about competing or more about cooperating. And maybe in a way, our group competition combined both a little bit because we had the competition, but also it was on the group level. So I was also cooperating with my group. So maybe that's an explanation why it was also, like also people responded to it that were not very high on enjoying competition per se but if you know who you're targeting then i think it's definitely always good to try and tailor it to that and otherwise as you say just throw in everything you got yeah, <laughs> i was don't know. <laughs> yeah. i was talking to a to a quite accomplished game designer the other day and i was just talking through this exact same issue of all of these different like tools in, in the toolbox and he said as a as, and I think he's shipped like 50 or 100, and these are just like video games, like iPhone games and PlayStation games, that they really design the game for the personality type. He said, well, we design completely different games for each one of those 
personality types. We never have like the budgets or the, the, the access to develop such like high quality material and sustainability. We usually, it feels like we're feeding off scraps, trying to, trying to make this stuff. But I thought it was really interesting that you would come up with a, like a whole different game based on a personality attribute of whether you were a more communal type of person or a competitive type of person or whatever, whatever, whatever you are. Can I just read out this? I just thought this sentence that was in your, your paper was interesting where it says competitive individuals are especially sensitive to the competitive cues of a social dilemma situation. Now you might've already answered this before, but I just thought that was, can you just dive into what that sentence means a bit more? Yes. So this was based on this idea that we do have people who differ in how competitive they are or how much they enjoy competition. And we do have the finding that people who are competitive are actually less cooperative in social dilemma situations. So they look more and more at their individual gain because they want to be better at, at this than others. And so they are the ones who also perceive this, this conflict of interest and perceive that they like need to outperform the others in this way. So how, how we implemented it in this in our study is they played also the game where they harvested from a common pool of fish. So ocean and a fish was a common resource. And there was a group of four fishermen who could like take consume from this resource. And you always see the score, like they get certain financial reward for every fish they take. And you see the score of your your harvest and uh, the others. So it is competitive to be better at this, to, to gain more. And people who enjoy competition or are very prone to comparing themselves to others, they are especially receptive to this, these cues that you're getting ahead or you're falling behind the others. Whenever I bring up the topic of leaderboards or competition or social comparison, it's all, and I only talk to environmental people really. And environmental people are usually like very kind, conscientious, caring type of folk. Somebody always says like, why do we have to use competition? Isn't that like a bad characteristic? Like, can't we all just, they're always like, can't we just cooperate? And it made me think that with the type of environmentally orientated people, like that they're like naturally like not the competitive types, which makes sense that I feel that they tend to be or our community tends to be more of a gentle, kinder, cooperative style of person, which is what's made you more sensitive to caring about the planet, right? Is that true that all of us who care about the planet are just not naturally competitive people? And so we tend to like maybe shun anything that's a bit more competitive orientated? Well, I, I do not know if there's data on this. It, it's possible. I, I could imagine that it's true that people who do care about the environment and are very pro-social and, and pro-environmental are maybe less competitive on average. But this is like the beauty of this competition in a way, because we, we can align the motives of, of those who want to do it for the environment and those who want to do it because they want to compete and because they want to be good at it and and maybe win this prize. So maybe there's something in there for, for both people, like the ones who want to do it for the environment and the ones who do not care about the environment, but maybe care about just competing. So that was the idea here as well. Yeah, I mean, it could be a way to get out to people that may not be as sensitive to these biospheric appeals or these sort of communal do it because it's the right thing type of messages, that there could be a... <clears throat> A, a strata of personality types that this this model could could get out to and I think next time somebody asks me the same question I think I'll be able to answer it better now uh, like I used <laughs> to just say oh well it's just good for everybody put everyone on a leaderboard like just get people to compete it works like get over it, everyone you know now that I can see it through this lens of different like styles of per personality you know it's also quite possible because people do sort of mimic each other in a group setting that if you were to activate a few highly competitive people to start competing just on the competition alone they could actually start percolating those behaviors through the group if someone's like just doing it for competition they don't care about the planet at all they could actually be a real role model in a way for other people to start mimicking those behaviors even a person who's very environmentally has very high environmental values, but not, might not be just feeling the personal agency that is kind of just not doing it. It'll, it'll just help like putting more behaviors in the pool 
and getting more examples that people can imitate. Yes. Yeah. And in that way, you've got thinking. Uh, yeah, and you've got you've got like the competition and the collaboration always happening simultaneously, because people sort of compete, but then they also need to help each other and need to support each other as well. More question. What? Ah. Okay. Next question is: What is the difference between competition and a social norm? We come up with social. We talk about social norms a lot. And a social norm can be like a data point, like this is the average. The average person is producing this much waste, making this much CO2, you're above or below average. And so that's kind of competitive, showing what everyone else is doing. So, I mean, how would you describe the difference? Yeah, so, I mean, showing what so social norm is what everyone else is doing or what everyone else is, or the majority of people is, is thinking is the right thing to do, right? And I think competition can be a way to, to achieve a social norm that is in, in this direction that we want. So we can make people start doing something and then other people will realize, oh, well, people are doing it. So maybe I can do it as well. Like you described before. So one person doing it for the competition can actually start like a social norm or establishes a new norm of behaving and, and therefore get other people to do it as well. I had a, a guest on who had done a lot of dashboard design of environmental data, and he was all about social norms, but it was all competition as well, because what he actually ran was these competitions in universe, in college dorms, showing the different dorms, their electricity consumption, and then ran a competition. So the norms and the competition were very much sort of like bundled up into the, mm. the same thing. And when he used the word social norms, I think what he was saying was comparing everybody else to everybody else. That when you say like, this is the benchmark, we'll compare you to the benchmark. And then we want you to do better than the benchmark. But there was this really strong narrative of saying, this is the new normal. Like this is how we do it. This is, this is who we are and this is how we do it. And this is why we do it. And so you've got this quantitative aspect of it in the competition where you have people's actual data and you can rank them and give them scores and stuff but then in the social norms it can be a bit more qualitative right like you've got this sense of identity values and just like what the like behavior is and this is normal like it's normal not to litter like once upon a time everybody used to litter from what I understand mm -hmm. and it was normal to litter now it's like really really bad to litter and so that is our new social norm I mean is that the way you would think of the, of the difference between the two? I think competition can be something else than, than social norms if we are not talking about comparing to other people, but we're just comparing like to a previous score, like we measure our energy consumption and then we try to reduce it without the social aspect. But I think it's more, way more powerful to do it in the social context. And then we do need these, like we are, consum <laughs> we are communicating social norms in a way if we're talking about how much the others are conserving. And I think it's very important to maybe stress how much they are conserving and not how much they are consuming, because that is also a norm that we are confronted with, that we see a lot of what other people are doing that is not good for the environment, like having at least one car and eating meat and flying on vacation. So this is also a very prevalent social norm that we have. But in, if we're using it in a way to communicate a change or that people, other people are also doing something and investing in reducing their consumption and it can be a very powerful tool to to foster sustainable behavior yeah so many people don't realize that like I can't believe I was like been doing it for like 15 or 20 years before I realized that there's this whole way of storytelling where people say this is what's wrong this is what people are doing wrong you're doing this wrong you're using that you're using that you're using that without realizing that people imitate each other and what you really need to be mm. saying is sort of flipping the inverse of that script and saying people are using reusable water bottles now, people are flying less, like whatever basically the behaviour you want people to imitate is the way that we need to be describing it. And like honestly, I don't think anybody, I'm sure some people know, but very few people in sustainability who are designing campaigns know that. I guess like mm. new knowledge, like they yeah. don't. <laughs> 
that's why we have to help get the get the message out what are you most excited about for your own upcoming research topics so i've started to to implement in in the social dilemma the aspect that people are uh, in most situations not equal in their preconditions so if we're talking about resource consumption individuals but also like larger ent entities like like states for example they have very different access to common resources and opportunities to consume just based on geographical location but also of course on their financial means for example I, if i if i have more money then i can consume more than others and so we're trying to look at how this influences this social dilemma structure and behavior in the situation and also how interventions that foster cooperation work when the actors have these very different preconditions because of course it can make it even more difficult like if we are not all equal and we we profit differently from this these common resources then it's even more difficult to pursue these collective interests and find a way to yeah, to get there. So I think there's a lot of research to be done to solve these issues. <laughs> Do you mean like people yeah. in the same country that might have a, a different income or a different background? Or do you mean much more dramatic differences, like, like a, a developing country that has like a lot of poverty and very sort of severe mm -hmm. financial restrictions versus like a wealthier country? Yeah, we can think about it at both levels. I think in general, like if, if there's a group of actors and they differ in their abilities to act in the situation that makes it of course even more difficult to find a common solution that that is good for all of them and they would all agree to and it can also be in different types like the opportunities to consume but also for example we know that consequences of climate change will be distributed very unequally like within societies but also across the world so this is also a huge issue like how who needs to deal with it if it hits the people differently? So that is what we are trying to tackle now. It seems to, to be what I've been thinking of recently and noticing in just this sort of overall like umbrella debate is that I think some people think that there is an environmental Shangri-La out there where we can solve all the environmental problems and nobody individually has to try very hard like it'll just be done for you. Like it'll all be like designed out, out of the system and you can just use electricity and just eat and enjoy your life. And the system has been completely designed for you to have no impact on the planet. But when you really start looking into the real like engineering problems around this, like, it, like it's quite difficult to give people a lot of electricity when you can't get it from solar or you don't have it from nuclear or from hydro or whatever, depending on, on where you are, there's often like just not an, an easy solution. So there doesn't seem to be any way to solve sustainability and climate change without people, no matter who you are, having to give something up. Like, however we're carving this out, there's a, there is a sense of like, people are going to have to go without if we're going to actually solve this are going to have to accept and I don't really like the whole like sacrifice we have to go without like do me you know like let's all live in a hut and live off like one loaf of bread a day or whatever but the the restrictions we're going to have to take to really get on top of this are going to be pretty pretty serious and there's going to have to be a pretty serious revelation around these these social dilemmas and really what they mean for a lifestyle that's been created for many of us it's very very easy like planes amazon buy whatever you want eat whatever you want make as much plastic as, as you want i mean we can't just like design this all away like you can have everything you want but we're just going to design the environmental mm. impact completely out of it like it's not really possible to do that i mean this is a bit of a bigger topic than just like specifically your research but but what do you think about, about that, that no matter how we gamify it or put people in groups or make it cool or sexy or fashionable or whatever, there's, we all need to accept that we're going to have to give up certain nice things that come with this very like environmental impact lifestyle. I totally agree that we cannot just go on like this and hope it will just resolve itself and, and somehow it will make a difference. And so we do need to change and maybe we need to focus more on these really like high impact behaviors 
because we're also investing a lot of energy in, in trying to change a lot of behaviors that are green in some way, like avoiding plastic packaging or switching off the light when you leave the room, but that do not have such a big impact on actual resource consumption in the end. And I think it's, it's also for the individual, it's quite demanding. Like if you have to think about every little decision that you're making, is this now more sustainable or less sustainable? Am I saving some energy here? It's very exhausting. <laughs> and maybe it would be better to try and really focus on some of the big behaviors and just change these and, and try to find alternatives there or cut back there. So it's not like every, everything that needs to change in, in our lives but some things need to change. We need to get there somehow. <laughs> and we just need to think about what would be the best ways to, to address this, to right. actually reduce consumption. So, right, just focusing on some big ticket items that might involve that more significant sacrifice, but not worrying too much about the, the smaller things. Yeah, it could be one way to go. <laughs> I mean, it's a hard thing to understand is getting people to truly deeply grasp a sense of us around around our resource our resource consumption i mean it, it is a nice thought to to hope that there will be some technological solution and we will just be able to go on and, and just consume less energy because it's more efficient or something but we do know from many studies as well that this doesn't really work out in often but if it's more efficient we will just use it more and then it, it won't save any energy or it's just not enough. So just really reducing consumption and, and sacrificing some things, yes, will actually reduce resource consumption in the end. So yeah, I think it's it's the way to go in the end. Yeah, it's like a big and, thing, I think, to to really to really grasp, to really grasp yeah. the the changes that are gonna have to have to happen. But again, I mean, we can also think about like how this could be positive for our lives. It doesn't always need to be a sacrifice in some way. So maybe I don't need meat every day. That's not what defines me. That's maybe not what I really, really need. So I can still be happy <laughs> without like this overconsumption of some things that we are just used to consume and it can still be a good life. So I, I don't want to take away everything, <laughs> but we need to get there somehow. It's true. I mean, I eat very little, if any, animal products. I live in a small apartment and live a, a somewhat pretty pretty simple life in my material input. And it's great. My, my life is wonderful because of the intellectual and creative and human connections that I make, not because of sort of the material thing. But but that's a whole other a whole other yeah. other conversation. So the, I finish off all the interviews with this question that if you could look a hundred years into the future. And everything would be better in the world. It would be what we would, the ideal outcome that we would want to have the planet and the world in in 100 years. What would be like one thing that you think we need to change to get there? If you could have one wish to get us there, what would it be? Well, that is a very difficult question. <laughs> well, if it's just really one thing, then I think I would go with the, the last thing we talked about, like this inequality between people, because I think it's, it's really weird that we are just taking it for granted that some people have so much more than others. And this also doesn't help in addressing these global issues. So I think we need to maybe try and, and, and reduce this inequality and maybe that will make it easier for us to act as a humanity, as a, as a real, as a big collective in preserving our Earth. Because often when you have access to more resources, it might make your environmental footprint go up a little bit, but it also gives you more headspace to consider more things. Like when you have a little bit more, I don't know, when you're not worried constantly about illness, mm -hmm. about poverty, about bills, about people in your family fighting with each other, you can have that headspace to just sort of dream for a couple of months or spend a couple of years educating yourself or have some emotional space to invest in some bigger, more altruistic things. So I think when we're talking about inequality, it's not just like the raw income and the, the, just the basic building blocks of life. It's also just having that emotional space to want to contribute to the world. And I think most people, as they move up that chain, as you have more space, you do naturally start to consider to make the world 
a better place at some point. I mean, some people might need millions and millions of dollars before they're like, I've bought every mansion, every sports car, and now I'm so bored of it now. We're all at different, different levels. But I think it is the natural end place that we get to is wanting to consider how to make a positive impact on the world around us. And it's very hard to do if you are really, really struggling with, with day-to-day life. And I've also seen this in the research yeah. as well. It's not just my own life observations. Well, I, I do agree that, of course, if you if you have these other problems, like really struggling to just have some roof over your head and, and get things, something to eat, you, you cannot like care about these broad issues and try to solve climate change. But like the other way around, if you do have a lot of resources, that automatically makes you consume more. Like we know that if, like the money you own, you, you earn, you will spend it on something and you can't spend it, of course, on like more sustainable things and less sustainable things but in the end there is a strong association like the more you have the more you will consume and they so i think that makes it very difficult as well to be sustainable yeah social dilemmas everywhere they're all they're all everywhere <laughs> so well that's the end of my my questions for today so thank you so much for joining us on the podcast leela it was a real joy to talk about your research and get so much sort of insights from you thank you for having me